there was a beautiful pipe ceremony this morning. I know it happens every year. Um, every month they have a mm -hmm. scheduled one to invite people up. What um, was your role in the pipe ceremony today? I guess uh, I always try to uh, make it a point to come to all pipe ceremonies. <clears throat> As I guess uh, First Nations University, that uh, one of our uniqueness is to have our our ceremonies and our feasts, and um, and it makes you feel that uh, you've done something worthwhile. This morning, I joined the pipe ceremony specifically to pray for the the well-being of the First Nations University with the staff for the staff, faculty, and students. What does your role as an elder in the university mean to you? I guess I find that my role as an elder in the First Nations University is that um, as an elder, we have to understand that our roles are to really help students to try and uh, help them overcome difficulties that they have maybe academically, perhaps maybe financially. We go even as far as uh, trying to help where there's marital problems. And I think that we always have to focus on trying to make the student understand that education is so important in today's society that we really um, uh, talk to them and try to assist them in sticking with their classes and completing their, their uh, courses in any way they can. What is the most common problem that students approach you with? Uh, usually I build a trust relationship with students and what they tell me is all kept confidential. And um, in my mind, I have uh, set a place here in this room where I, I envision that there's a wooden box. What the students tell me, I put it in there, I close it, and I go home. I don't carry it with me. I don't even discuss uh, students' problems with my husband. And I think uh, trust and confidentiality is very important. But in comparison to the majority of time, I think it's financial problems that they have. You know, they get um, student allowance once a month. And sometimes they try and make a living for one month on that budget of their allowance is very difficult. That's where the frustration comes in. And and sometimes they have to pay rent out of that, you know, so there's, and sometimes there's families. <laughs> so that's the most common problem that students come with. It's always financial problems. Um, how do you feel when you are able to help the students? Uh, I know when I help a student and like maybe a month later, I see them walking in the building, still carrying their books. I know that's an achievement that um, they have listened well and that I have helped them. I guess the biggest pride uh, as an elder here is seeing students walk across stage to get uh, their diplomas, certificates, and their degrees. I know they have to go through those certification and um, and then comes the degrees but a lot of times um, you know you the students sometimes they need a lot of guidance in choosing a career because sometimes they come in maybe they'll take classes from INCAD and oh no we want to turn go this other way so I think that's where they need a lot of assistance to tell them what classes to take in order to maybe go into uh, social work or whatever their career is. Um, are there things that you have learned from the students? <laughs> Over the years that I've been here, I've learned a lot from the students. Uh, some new things, ideas have emerged. 
I do realize each generation is changing. Uh, you know, many years ago, I think in the early 70s, I took classes through, at that time, the SIFC. At that time, you know, the cost of everything was not as high priced as today. You know, today everything is, the prices are way up. So that's one of the great changes I see happening. Uh, the other thing is when I, I took classes only, maybe uh, two classes a month, it was called, uh, I guess, the module system where we take maybe uh, political science for one month. It went like that. But today the difference is students are taking full classes and, you know, sometimes I feel that uh, when they do that, it's kind of overbearing for them. And that's the change I see. Do you think that they'd be more successful if they, um, if they, if uh, they were taught a module way? I think so, because it'll give them, uh, you know, traditionally, a long time ago, First Nations people, we never lived under structured time. And when I say that, what I mean was, we don't get up and say, we have to be there 8 o'clock. We have to be here a certain time. Today we live in that kind of a society. And as First Nations people, long time ago, my grandparents used to say, take your time, understand what you're doing. You know, do things in a very... Uh, I guess slowly to get, I guess, the hang of whatever we're going to do. But today, you know, everything is such a fast pace that we're trying to keep up. And sometimes it's within us as a First Nation person that that wasn't the way we were raised up. For my part, I wasn't raised up like that, like I did things at a slow pace. And I remember my grandparents saying, when you, you do everything at a certain time, you're hurrying up, it releases, it gives you a lot of stress. And combined with trying to, you know, study and all that, sometimes I feel pity for the students, you know. So that was how it was with me growing up. Like I went to school, but at a... Day school, we had to walk to school. We took our time, had fun on the way, <laughs> you know. We got there and we went to school for from 9 o'clock, but today it has changed drastically. Yeah. Um, that was my next question about sharing <laughs> about your childhood and growing up. Um, <clears throat> what are some of the things that you learned from your elders? From my elders, uh, back home on Standing Buffalo, we have the very, very old elders. And our community has agreed that we let these old, old elders rest. It's time for them to be at peace and not to be worrying about what they have to do. It's from the 55 to about 65 year old, or some that could go further than 65, we say we are the active ones. And from the old elders, all my teachings really come from my grandmother, my grandfather. I think back today that some of the things that I do, that I say, the way I behave, my belief system all comes from my grandparents. They were my teachers and also from the other elders. When I have a question today, I go to them. I sit with them and I ask them, you know, uh, you know, questions like um, maybe I'm having problems with my siblings, my, my family. Well, I'll go to another elder and ask for their advice. So, and usually uh, they tell me, give me ideas how things should be uh, working, the things that I should be saying as an elder. That's my guidance today. That's what I walk with, going to the old elders in my community. Then um, growing up, was it easy to, um, like, approach them? Uh, growing up, 
when I was, my grandparents instilled a lot of uh, respect for everything within me. And growing up, we didn't have television and all this new technology. So I just had my grandparents and I was taught to sit and listen to what they were saying. They told me if I didn't listen and if I didn't, you know, try to hear them out what their teachings were, someday down the road I'll be I'll have a lot of problems. And I believe that's true. So like today I uh, try to tell that to young, I go into the classrooms a lot. And this is what I tell young children, you've got to learn to listen. And I think the most important thing is respect. Today, a lot of our young people have lost that. You know, when an elder speaks to them, they don't uh, tend to listen. Um, at times, I've even been told that, well, those things happen when people were born on a buffalo robe, you know. But I said it still applies today, no matter how we live, you know. It's all right to learn our traditional ways in our prayers, our ceremonies, as well as go to the mainstream way of education and learn. Get your degrees, and when you balance both out, you're the one that's going to be successful. What does the term warrior mean to you in today's society? Warrior? Today, uh, in today's society, I think uh, young people take the word very uh, not seriously. Long ago, uh, a warrior meant that you had to go out there and like fight for a good cause to protect your people for protection of land, maybe for protection of um, your tribe, you know, and those were the warriors. And when, in our language, we say toka, when you, you fought with the, another tribe, I always remember my grandma saying, he wiaka shaich iapi. They give them an eagle feather and it's painted red. That means they fought the enemy for a good cause. Today, the word warrior by young people is used and taught of in a different term, in a different way. Today, warrior is strewn around very loosely. You know, we're warriors of this, we're warriors of that. And to me, that's wrong. And today, the word a lot of times gang members think themselves as warriors, you know, and that's not uh, right. I always say that there's warriors of many different uh, careers. Those that maybe get their doctorate degrees, they're warriors of education. Maybe in the government system, like leaders, they take a lot. Those are warriors of uh, government systems. And maybe as um, a family gathering, one takes the lead. That individual is a warrior of protecting his family, his relatives. That's the way I look at the word warrior. Um, and the other way of a long, long time ago, it was all mostly, it was a great uh, honor to be a warrior. And today it's looked at like there's a lot of negativity attached to the word warrior and like I said our gangs believe in that and that's not right. Do you think that there is room to reclaim that um, with from the students here do you think that there's room to make it in a positive way? Uh, I think it all depends on each individual you know young people have uh, ideas different ideas but I think as elders, if we sit with the young people and talk to them, explain to them what we know as um, describing the word warrior, that'll help a lot. And maybe um, 
I always say children are never too young to learn. Maybe if we go into the classrooms and start teaching about grade uh, three, four, five, and teach them the word warrior, long ago it was a great pride to be a warrior. They were decorated in different ways. Um, I come from a family, their last name is Trawiaka, which means the rarer of an eagle feather, and that pertains to the great-great-grandfather who was a, a warrior. He defended his people, his tribe, for, I guess, land and that. He was a great warrior. So from there, that, that name was given to him, the wearer of an eagle feather. That's what it means, Tawiyaka. And maybe things like that we could teach the young people so they'll have a better understanding of the word warrior. Um, why is it important to combine the traditional teachings with the academic studies? Um, I think a lot of our academic studies, if we work hard enough, we could almost implement our traditional teachings into the academia. I was, I used to be a language instructor for 17 years in my community. I took the time and the effort to go to each classroom, maybe in a science department, when they're teaching a science class. I would go and sit with the teacher at the end of the day and say, what are you teaching tomorrow? Maybe she would say, we're teaching about plants and that. So when I went in for my class to teach, I spoke in my language. But at the same time, I taught uh, the meaning of the plants in a, how we use them for medicines, how we, shouldn't, we should protect the flowers, because each flower that grows on Mother Earth is a medicine for some tribes and for ours included too, and Dakota people. Uh, and that way they had a better understanding. You know, sometimes they planted beans in a cup. Well, I would talk about um, growing uh, plants for food, you know. So I, we combined both, and it seems it worked out very well. And I think here at the university, I do go into the classrooms especially in the indigenous classes. And I talk about many things uh, in today's uh, world as how they're living. And I talk about the old traditional ways, like um, just the uh, Saturday I was in, uh, in a class. They had a class from 10 o'clock. I was in there talking about, um, I guess, the galaxies, you know, the stars and that what they mean to Indian people. And what I learned, you know, I revealed to the class there, and they were really surprised that as First Nations people, we walked with the knowledge of the stars. And how important are the TP teachings today? Okay. Uh, I'd have to say I come from uh, the Dakota Sioux tribe, <clears throat> and there our TP teachings are different. Uh, I know the TP teachings of the Cree and the Soto are are together, and I like their version of their TP teachings. But us two in our Dakota way, we, we have the TP, and in the middle, uh, from the top to the bottom, there's a a stake where there's a, uh, it used to be long ago, we say tied with tohmeso, which means the edging of the hide was cut when the hide was cured and ready to use for clothing, making teepee, whatever. And all the hair was scraped off and that. The edging around was made into a rope and there was a slit and they were attached that was tied from the center pole to the, it staked down in the middle of the teepee. We believe that's a very sacred significance of the Sundance Lodge. Because Sundance Lodge, we have a sacred tree in the middle. And there's many teachings to that 
to that tohmas or to that stake that's tied in the middle. And then we believe so far at the bottom of our teepee is the people, everybody, the children and that. Then the next part, there's many teachings of the youth, the young people. And then towards the top is the teachings of adults, adult people, um, teachings of how to be a mother, how to be a father. And way the top is the elders, the teachings come down. That's our belief of a, a teepee, of the structure of a teepee. And when you look at the teepee, they open out the flaps. And that's when we say the great Tonkanshina, Wakaya Naji, the grandfathers, got its arms open looking up to that. That's how we know that there's ceremony taking place in a teepee. That's how we understand, okay, there's maybe a um, name-giving ceremony because the flaps are open. And that's what we believe in is that they call the people. And the other thing that the teepee itself, when it's made of hides, uh, there's many ceremonies that take place because our worldview as Dakota people, we believe that anything that's alive, the trees, the grass, is very sacred to us. That's why we use the term mitakwi owase. When we say that, we acknowledge the four-legged, the birds, anything that's, <clears throat> that's out there and has a beating heart and it's alive. In our way, when they first finish the teepee with maybe all buffalo hides. That's when there were ceremonies and there was a big feast. We prayed um, to the spirit of that buffalo that's going to shelter us. And that's how we, we lived long ago. And, you know, today, of course, you realize all teepees are made with canvas. Huh? And sometimes I see... Uh, people doing pipe ceremony and they're doing a big feast. But, you know, I think those traditional ways, spiritual ways, should be done if the teepee is made fully of animal hide. Because they say the spirit of that animal is within that teepee. With all the, it was made with all those hides, maybe of buffalo, deer, whatever. That's what we believe in. So... Um, did you grow up on um, Standing Buffalo? I was born at home yeah. and at Standing Buffalo, delivered by my <clears throat> grandmother, who was a midwife. And I, I lived there till I grew up. Then, of course, I was sent to residential school until 1952. At that point, there was a school built on a reserve, so then I went to school there till 90, I spent five years at the day school, and then I went back to Librette again, where I did my uh, <clears throat> nine and 10. And by that time we were able, and we were allowed to go to provincial schools. So then I attended school for grade 11 and halfway of grade 12 in a little village called Lipton, Saskatchewan. So my sister and I were the first ones to go to a provincial school from our community. Mm. I know that uh, you weren't um, encouraged to speak your language or anything at the schools. How did you um, hold on to that? Well, um, growing up with my grandparents, my first language was Dakota language. And as I grew up older, my grandma had relatives in Pipestone, Manitoba. They used to write to her in our language. So then she would open the letters and then I would read them to her. That's how I learned to uh, read and write my language. Other than that, I spoke, when I first went to Librette, I hardly knew how to speak the English language. And but you know, when you're really, I understood right away when I went to Librette, don't speak your language, that's a bad way. You know, the, the nuns will tell us. 
But I knew immediately that, you know, praying about my language, because my grandparents used to say, our language and the words in it are very sacred. I didn't know the meaning at the time, but now today I realize what they meant. <clears throat> so when they used to school us, they couldn't even say, uh, like, how are you? You know, they'll hear you right away. They'll come and take you out in the hall and, you know, they'll kind of push you and don't speak that language. You're not supposed to be speaking that here. You understand? We'll say yes. But, you know, when we went up to the chapel early in the morning, they'll wake us up, send us to Mass. I used to sit up there in the pews, and I knew we had to pray. And I knew we were allowed only to pray in English. So I used to pray in English and ask, I guess, Jesus or God, to help me to keep my language, you know, because that's what I, they taught me at home. Always pray for your language, you know, even pray in Dakota. Today, that's how comes I pray in my language. And I hung on to it that way, and I think I was blessed that I didn't lose my language, neither my culture. You know, a lot of the, the way I live today is following my culture, Culture is a way of life that we have to understand to follow. Traditions is totally different. It belongs to maybe a family. They do something uh, a certain time of the year and it carries on for one generation. That's what tradition is. Maybe a family is good at making star quilts. That's their tradition. But culture is totally different. It's a way of life. And that's the way I understand it. And that's the way I teach uh, language and culture together. Um, did you ever, uh, like after residential school, did you ever, did you um, um, like pick up any kind of like addictions or anything? I know lots of people had experience. Uh, of course, there was a time in my life that uh, I guess I was a social drinker, I'll admit. Weekends, you know, I drank. But uh, I quit that because I had to teach my language. And I knew that our traditional ways, our, uh, our culture doesn't coincide with doing drugs or, yeah. or, uh, or drinking. So... I kind of fought the battle. You know, sometimes my friends would invite me to maybe, especially Christmas parties, like they would put up, everybody was there smoking and drinking. and But those were the times I remember I'll run to the bathroom and I'll pray. And I was able to handle it, like I to sit with them, laugh with them and talk to them. But, you know, sometimes when I le left, I, I used to always think, why am I doing this? I could have been sitting where they're having fun and, you know, that and yet. But then again, I used to think, well, I'm teaching my language. I've got to stick to that, you know. So sometimes it was a battle. Uh, I think I, I just weekends I drank when I was drinking. And then I quit smoking in 1984. I smoked before that, but not heavily, you know, just because I, I used to be in class all day and there is no smoking allowed. So maybe in the evening I'll have tea and a cigarette and that. And I knew like tobacco was used in a very sacred way uh, and I had to respect that also. So there was a lot of, um, I wouldn't say roadblocks, but there was a lot of uh, respect that I had to carry myself in, in order to be a good uh, language teacher. Is there anything else that you want to add? Uh, I think, um, like, sometimes students come in here, like today we're, um, we sat with the um, um, interim president and um, I guess the, her executive, and they're having kind of um, different emotions and ideas about the new board and their battling that 
So like I was telling them, I said, a lot of times there are things that happen that's way beyond our control. We can't make a change. We can't do anything about it. So in our, trad in our cultural way, I said, we have to understand we pray hard and we have to look a different way and think of that in a positive way. And like she said, well, what is that? I said, a lot of people are, are um, unhappy with uh, Dr. Shanine Pete no longer going to be the president. You know, they, everybody had their hopes up high and saying that, you know, she she's put her name in and maybe she'll be selected. But I said, we are getting a new president. I said, so pray and accept him, shake hands to him, welcome him. And if you do that, good things will happen to you. You know, that's our our belief system. I said, a lot of times we live too much in the negative where we do harm to ourselves by getting stressed, depressed, many of these negative emotions. And don't do that to yourself. You have to be strong enough to change things to the positive. No matter how terrible they might be, no matter if it's happening to your own family, to yourself, always be strong to think, well, there is this positive way and maybe I should be thinking that way. It's entirely up to all of us to make changes. It's Nobody can do that for us. And if you can do it, you know, pray. Sit in, a, in our sacred place, the teepee, and pray hard and ask for that guidance and it'll always help you. Because sometimes, you know, there's uh, many things that even in our daily lives, our families, maybe one family member is doing wrong. Maybe they're into, you know, something they shouldn't be. You know, those are the ones you're supposed to pity instead of getting angry at them, saying, you know, things we shouldn't be saying to them. Instead, in your mind, pity them, try to help them. And that way, it'll relieve that uh, that bad feeling you're carrying. Because it could turn to, uh, like I said, something really negative where it'll affect your, your whole being. Like, And the other thing I tell students, always, you know, be who you are. Don't try to imitate somebody else because each and every one of us are special. We each have a spirit and we have to learn to nurture that. And that's where like all these teachings come out from that spirit within us. And we've got to be knowledgeable, like generosity, kindness, always focus on a positive rather on a negative. And I think that's life. <laughs>